Hello everyone, you are all very welcome to the class within the module World Music Survey in the framework of the Master Program in Ethnomusicology at the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance, the University of Limerick in Ireland. And my name is Fernando Lopez and I have prepared a session today about the work of the Guatemalan composer Joaquín Orellana. This class is entitled Joaquín Orellana, the sound genius that reimagines music. So I have to mention to start that uh, Joaquín Orellana is an icon of Guatemalan contemporary music. And in my opinion, he's uh, the pioneer of music and sound justice in Guatemala. His work has been presented in many parts of the world, in US, Europe, Asia, and of course, Latin America. So in order to do justice to his work and for you to understand what it symbolizes, I'm going to present some features of his multifaceted and massive production that strongly resonates and impacts in the global south, particularly in Latin America and in Guatemala. I will also refer some insights and opinions from various Latin American and European scholars about Oriana's work. So, this class is based on an interview with Joaquín Orellana and orchestra conductor Julio Santos from Guatemala, conducted on the 3rd of March 2022. Actually, they empowered me to present information from internet related to Orellana's work. So, I'm going to use for this class a sort of visual essay as um, bringing together two of his most recent works. Firstly, the exhibition in New York entitled The Spine of Music by the, yeah, sponsored by the American Society of Music in 2021. And second, the symphony from the third world, Sinfonia desde el tercer mundo, premiered at Documenta 14 Festival in Greece in 2017 and in Guatemala City in 2018. So, really welcome. So, welcome to the class Joaquín Orellana, the sound genius that reimagines music and ethnomusicological approach. So, to start, I have to mention that uh, I was invited by himself in 2008 to record and produce the album Cancioncillas Nostalgimientes Bufonantes, a set of Oriana's songs that talk about love and saudade. So for me, it's a great honor to present some features of his vast production. So, um, Joaquín Orellana was awarded a scholarship in 1973 to study at the Institute Torcuato di Tela in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And during this time, he approached the electronic music with the avant-garde composition techniques of the time. But uh, Joaquín Orellana um, considers himself as a prism that reflects the injustice of social reality. And on his own words, mm, what sings in Guatemala are the voices of this reality that has been silenced for many centuries. So the next slide is related to the key uh, sonic features in Oriana's music. I'm going to share some interesting opinions here. Um, 
So, Orellana's production is supported with the Utiles Sonoros sound tools invented by himself. Orellana states that a sound tool replicate sounds similarly to the electroacoustic resources used by other composers in sequencers. So with these self-built sound tools, he's advocated what he called Ambito Sonoro Social, Social Sound Environment. And he has composed several pieces in which he interweaves sounds of classical orchestra human voices and percussive resources based on elements of wood and iron. So with these sound tools, his music in contrast random rhythms and non-Western timbers with the traditional sounds of classical music. And, but, in the next slide, I'm going to, sh to, to show you some interesting um, opinions also, this time from uh, Koryu Naharonian, in order to um, approach uh, Oriana's production, the nature of Oriana's production. But there was a leading factor in the creation of his sound tools. On his return to Guatemala from Argentina, he challenged himself for not to reproduce an European vanguardism but neither to return to a musical Guatemalan traditional path. So he began to collect sounds of phonemes from the indigenous Guatemalan languages in order to approach new meanings that later gave rise to a set of pieces called humanophonias. During his studies at Torquato di Tela Institute, he was influenced by contemporary artists and, in fact, the first Humanophonia was presented in 1975 within the framework of these courses. So, the Montevideo-based publishing house Editorial de Esfuerzos Discográficos announced Joaquín Morellana has become one of the aesthetic torches of the new generation through the Latin American courses of contemporary music organized by the Uruguayan Armenian Corium Aharonia. So, on his return to Guatemala, Orellana, and given the lack of resources to achieve an electroacoustic technology, like the one available in Buenos Aires, Oriana decided to approach particularly the Guatemalan marimba in order to figure out how that instrument could be projected beyond itself. So this approach led to the creation of more than 73 sound tools, a huge orchestra of sound tools that um, gradually began to inspire new generation of, of more open-minded creators. For example, Michel Dermont, who says that the Imbaluna sound tool embodies an intrinsic surrealism. The Imbaluna sound tool is what we are watching here in this in this slide. So, but Oriana argues that this opinion contrasts with the opinions generated by his sound tools in conservative Guatemalan society upon his return from, from Argentina. Um, so, one can perceive Oriana's music as a social act of sounding and listening, but his music in has impacted also visual arts. And as it has been mentioned by many Oriana's work analysts and curators, for example, Rosina Casali in Guatemala 
and the American Society at Visual Curators, Aime Iglesias, Diana Fletcher, and Sebastian Zubieta, among others. Um, some, of, some of them have also mentioned that Oriana Sound tours embed and perform choreographic movements. And Oriana, in our interview, explained to me that the sonarimba, for example, is performed with an up, back and forward movement of the arms in whose movement a kind of choreography is projected between the gesture and the resulting sound. We're going to watch this um, sonarimba and the next slides. And also uh, in the imbaluna that we've seen before, the need to move the rolling drumstick within the crescent-shaped curve that gave name to the instrument, to the sound tool, determines a choreographic gesture. So, Oriana uh, argues that the choreographic movement was only an outcome associated with the playing of the sound tools. But what is important to, to, to highlight uh, here in this class uh, from the ethnomusicological point of view is that Oriana's music is considered essential to create, maintain and challenge personal and social identities. As mentioned by the Guatemalan sociologist Maria Privado, Oriana's pieces are clustered within the denouncing ideological approach, but their objective is not the mere fact of denouncing. They are actually projected as a musical sonorous rescue of historical memory in Guatemala. And I also would say here that Oriana's music, for me, is crucial to start the ethnomusicological discussion about sound justice. Based on what was mentioned by curators Fleto and Subieta in the Spine of Music exhibition in New York that we're going to, to watch in the next uh, slide. This exhibition is very important because it's the first time that we are collaborating and that we're trying to show the interdisciplinary nature of culture in the Americas. Oresana is a key example of how music has influenced visual arts all over the continent and over its history. This is the first exhibition of Joaquin Oresana in the United States, organized along with the music department of America Society. What makes Orellana different from other composers, that, uh, from other avant-garde composers that have been working the you know, past 50 years, is that he invented a bunch of instruments, different models of instruments that help, helped him create his, the sound world that he needed. The instruments that Oriana makes are mostly based on the marimba, so they're a percussion instrument and I'm the visual person on this side, but they have um, a resonator that comes off the bottom. And we learned actually while we were speaking with Joaquin Oriana in his studio that the shape of the instrument originates from the gesture. So it's not a sculpture in the sense that he's making the image first, but he knows you want this to be played like this and he makes an imbaluna. Yeah. 
One thing that's really important and interesting about Oriana's work to me, besides just the visual or materiality or the sound, is his relationship to Guatemalan culture and indigeneity. And he has these compositions that have highlighted, you know, the issues from when he started in the 70s through today, having to do with violence against indigenous people and the civil wars at those times. Guatemala was in the middle of a very, very bad civil war for 40 years. So when he went back, there was still 25 more years until the peace was signed. So that uh, violence, especially against indigenous peoples, that, that was really, really pronounced in Guatemala is very present in this idea of justice and of, of sound justice, of justice that is, and, and the sound of the people. He was, he's very, very committed to that. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, I will also present the symphony from the third world in Athens, Greece, Sinfonia di the Tercer Mundo. And this work is, in my opinion, a monument to sound justice and historical memory in Guatemala. And I also consider that this is one of the best ensembles performed in the musical history of the country. So in the following, I will quote, uh, refer opinions of the composer Joaquin Oriana and the orchestra conductor Julio Santos as well, uh, in order to um, describe the um, sound behavior of all the elements involved in this symphony. So to start, I will mention what uh, Julio Santos shared with me in our interview. So for Julio Santos, conducting this symphony represented a challenge, and not only because of the number of sonic elements involved, but also because of the historical and social context that Oriana challenges in the symphony. So the previous knowledge of uh, Julio Santos uh, about the different works included in the symphony was key, was essential in order to, to perform uh, the emancipatory discourse uh, that the symphony enacts. So for Santos, the technical part of the work is extremely strong, but on the other hand, the human perspective uh, port portrays uh, a country that continues to suffer the injustice inherited by the colonialism. And, and also Oriana told me, described me in his own words, the key um, uh, factors for this composition. So Oriana says that this symphony is the fusion of passages from works that uh, have been composed at key moments of social injustice. Mm, for example, Sacra Tánica and Ramajes de una Marimba Imaginaria. So for Oriana, these pieces are like characters that cannot be missing in the symphony. And they have a nostalgic theme and represent the hunger for justice that has prevailed in Guatemala. And then when, when uh, Imposible a la X uh, in Ramajes de una Marimba Imaginaria came out, Oriana's work began to be situated within a clearly ideological musical stream and began to gain acknowledgement and consensus at an uh, international level. So, the impulse of his studies at the Torqueta di Tela Institute, the crisis 
uh, between the old Guatemalan music and the social sound environment were shaping what became the symphony from the third world uh, that was premiered at Documenta 14, Documenta 14 festival, which is an important political festival born after the horrors of the Second World War. So this journey of a struggle in kind of Joaquin Orellana's music uh, since 1970 came to fruition in 2017. Yeah, after suf uh, suffered strong criticism in the Guatemalan media and the censorship of some of his works, such as the theater opera En los Cerros de Ilom by the Guatemalan army in 1992, among others. Now, um, let's see part of uh, a rehearsal in the Megaron Theater in Athens with the symphonic orchestra and the municipal choir of that city. Conducting the orchestra is Maestro Julio Santos. In our interview, Oriana also gave me some nuances about the Sinfonia desde el Tercer Mundo. Um, he said that the symphony embodies a theme that resembles the folkloric without necessarily being folkloric. And there are also displacing musical sections in the choirs and in the orchestra that leads to the light motif, which is performed as a cry in an unknown language. And he mentions that this composition, his composition, does not escape um, into the music itself. It goes uh, kind of straightforward, looking to what it wants to express. Uh, which is the social injustice suffered since the times of colonialism. Um, so, for Oriana, uh, La Sinfonia desde el Tercer Mundo, the symphony from the Third World, is a document in addition to its expressive counter structure. And I, and I mention this because Oriana also told me that in Athens came out a theme related to the sound of hunger and that this was expressed in the words of the poet Luis de Leon who disappeared in the Civil War from his book El Tiempo Principia en Chivalva, Time Begins in Chivalva. And then Oriana uh, realized in Greece that the symphony took shape as, uh, as the literary work of a warrior. Having said, having said that, I, I'd like now to show you some passages of this symphony. Um, the, the following excerpts, um, the following video, 
uh, was recorded live at the National Theatre of Guatemala City in September 2018. And the orchestra was also conducted by Maestro Julio Santos and Joaquin Oriana participated uh, as the poet in, in the declamation. So, I, I think that the entire symphony is well worth seeing, but here I will present only a few excerpts to understand crucial moments of the symphony. And I also will refer Orianna's and Julio Santos' insights uh, regarding uh, particularly to the role played by the sound elements in key moments of the performance. So, in the first uh, excerpt, um, Julio mentions that the symphonic orchestra represents the European music, which appears only at the beginning and then gradually disappears. And this part is clearly referred to the process of the Western invasion, which is characterized by an energetic treatment of the sections of brass and string. Between the Western flutes, the orchestra of sound tools appears, representing the Guatemalan people to symbolize the resistance. The Guatemalan people appear with their own sound language and gradually takes over the stage with the marimba in exile and the human voices to perform a sort of historical claim.
then appears the raised marimba to join the resistance together with the choir of adults and children to emphasize the human part and carry the light motif Ushikibi Shaneli, which runs through and closes the work. The poet, who is played by Joaquin Orellana himself, makes the message much clearer. Marimba advance, throw, shout, penetrate, shake the jungle. Avanza marimba, lanza, grita, penetra, desgarra la tierra, danza feroz, inventa, destruye las varias y despierta el mugido de los sementales, ulular y palante, ulul.
sonorous rebellion of the sound tools represents here the beginning of the armed resistance of the Guatemalan people, which grew over the years and led to the state repression that intensified during the 36 years of the civil war in Guatemala. Listen and watching and listening to these videos, the sharp decolonial thinking of ethnomusicologist Elizabeth Mackinlay uh, resonates with me when she says that ethnomusicologists must shake, um, rattle, and roll ethnomusicology. Uh, into a more ethical way of attending to its colonial complicity. And, and it is a kind of not please uh, chapter in the discipline. And, and, and she also you know, reminds me, okay, or reminds us that decolonization 
is a program of complete disorder and it cannot come as a result of magical practices and uh, nor of a friendly understanding. And I quote this interesting um, uh, idea here because when I mentioned that it resonates, resonates with me, it is because obviously in this symphony there are moments that do not necessarily lead to a friendly understanding between the two contending uh, sound fields. So I think that this work is main for sound justice in Guatemala from a decolonial approach in the field of applied ethnomusicology. And it is decolonial because it challenges the traditional way of listening to music, particularly in Guatemala, with sonic elements that uh, at some extent disturb and question the traditional way of listening to music in the country. Um, uh, what at the end questions the sonic structure of Guatemalan society. And this uh, class also teaches me that this is for me a fascinating uh, field of future inquiry. So I will present now the last excerpt of this uh, symphony. At the end, the orchestra of sound tools and the raised marimba, along with the human voices, enact the sound of hunger, and the poet closes the symphony, calling for future resistance from the Guatemalan rhythms of emancipation and hope. Hope, music in sones, and waiting.
So I have to finish by highlighting uh, some key findings of this class uh, about uh, Joaquin Orellana's work. So Joaquin Orellana is one of the pioneers of music for social and sound justice in Guatemala. And Orellana's approach takes the risk of positioning new truths which were excluded from this tradition in music. Joaquin Orellana's humanophonia embeds historical and social forces at play in the symbolic contestation of Guatemala's sound behavior. And the sound tools expand a social meaning seeking to perform a global process of cultural resistance for sound justice in Guatemala as well. Uh, in the symphony from the third world, La Sinfonía desde el Tercer Mundo, is a social performative process. And this, is, this symphony, in my opinion, is a gigantic intermedial ensemble in Guatemala Mm, that I've ever seen before. It's a masterpiece for the colonial construction of knowledge in Guatemalan ethnomusicology and to start the discussion about sound justice in the country. It is a local musical practice with strong performative elements such as sonic bonding and entrainment for music in ideas. Music in ideas is a concept that I am proposing here, inspired by the Irish scholar Triona Ni Hihan. And talking with the scholar Gerardo Mesa, the symphony is an intersemiotic translation that involves the subversive role of poetry in a collective singing that results in a loud claim for justice in Guatemala. Uh, in Joaquin Orellana's symphony, from the third world, according to Small, the Guatemalan people enact who they are, but also who they hope to become. And Joaquin Orellana's work challenges Guatemalan society by saying that music, making music, is in Guatemala still a matter of life and death, according to Timothy Rice. And after almost nine decades of tireless production, Joaquin Orellana um, is still questioning a conservative society in Guatemala that does not value his enlightened vision for art, of art for emancipation. Um, nevertheless, he's charting the course of art worldwide with his sonorous tools to reimagine music. And he navigates his journey, inspiring artists that follow the path of his sonorous wearer footsteps. So um, at the end, I, I want to say thank you very much to Joaquin Morellana and Julio Santos for all the information uh, provided for this class and also for the gift of being part of their students and friends. And, well, and thank you very much to all of you for your attention.